Welcome back, everybody. So today, a lot of you are taking the midterm. Good luck if you're taking the midterm today. Um, in class, we're going to continue our discussion of objects. So on Monday, I introduced you to the syntax that you can use to declare a new type in Java. So this limitation that we were operating under up till this point where there were only eight types of data that we can work with has been removed. And now you can design your own types to model and to fit whatever data you want to work with in your program. And hopefully at the end of class today, if we have a little time, we'll do an exercise where we think about, let's come up with something in the world, some piece of real world data that we might want to work with, and figure out how to model it in our program. All right, so just a little re a review from last time. So this is uh, Java's syntax that allows you, the programmer, to declare a new type, a new type of variable. We refer to these types of variables as objects um, in your program. And so I'd see on line one, I'm saying class. That's uh, sort of, I was thinking about this last time. I mean, there's sort of a, the sort of deep ontological concerns here, right? A class represents a type of thing in the world, right? So in this case, I'm using this, the name that I'm giving it person follows the class definition. That probably hints that I'm gonna use this to model information about people. And then I can have two things in my class definition. I can have variables uh, that are associated with the, each instance of the class, each object that I create of this type. So every person in my program is gonna have a name and an age. Um, I can also do initialization in the declaration of the class, so this is valid. So I can say the age is declared to be zero. We'll look at another better way to do that um, in a few slides. So part of the object, state. What is the information that I'm storing here? And so again, up until this point, there was no way to couple together a string and an int. But now, if I have a piece of data like a person where I want to use both of those types of information to store, to model them or to store data about them, I can do that. I can also declare that a particular type of Java object provides certain functionality. It can do certain things. And I do that by declaring methods as part of my class declaration. So down at the bottom here, from line seven on, I'm declaring two methods. The first one is called print name, doesn't return anything, takes no arguments, and simply prints the name of that person object. The second one is called birthday, and that's a function that increments the age of the person. You'll see here that I don't have to use the this keyword, so both line nine and line 12 are valid. We'll talk in a minute about how Java resolves names when it's um, executing or compiling functions that are included as part of a class uh, declaration. Okay. If I wanna be explicit about what I'm referring to, I can use this special keyword called this. This is another reserved word in the language. Whenever I'm running a function that's part of a class, this refers to the instance of the class that's running that function. So I can use that to refer to my instance variables. So in this case, I have my dimensions class from last time that has a width and a height, and my area function is returning the area of this particular dimension, the so width times the height. This always refers to the instance of the class, the particular object that's executing that method. Because this method is associated with an instance of this class. So whenever I call area, I always have an instance of the class. I can't call that function until I've created an object of that type. So this also works. Like I just said, I don't need to use this. Okay, so, um, and this is sometimes, this version without this is sometimes clearer and cleaner. So how does Java run this code, right? So this is weird, right? This is strange, it's different than the function um, the functions that we've looked at before. Because you might wonder, you know, if you're Java and you're running this uh, code, you're trying to compile this code, you start compiling this area function. It takes no arguments. And there's no local variables that have been declared as part of this function, so how can I refer to a width and a height? Where do those variables come from? 
Well, when the Java compiler compiles this code, remember that's the first stage before I execute it, it comes to this variable and it says, okay, this is interesting. There's a, there's the, this function is using a variable called width. And it says, is there a local variable in this function called width that's been defined inside the function body? The answer is no. Is there a parameter to the function called width? Maybe one of the, maybe the function has parameters and you've decided to call one of them width. No. The next place it looks is on the class definition. So now it says, okay, well, there's no parameters to this function, there's no local variables that have been declared, let me look in the dimensions class where this method is defined and see if I can find something called width, and sure enough, the dimensions class has a width variable. One thing I wanna explain, and this is gonna be something that you're gonna see more often on the rest, for the rest of the semester. In Java, everything is part of a class. Every function that you write in Java has to be part of a class. Every variable that you declare has to be either inside a function as a local variable or declared to be part of a class. Now you may be wondering, any code that you write has to be inside a function which itself has to be defined on a class. So you might be wondering, how have we been doing these examples on the slides like the one that we started, like the one that's on the cover slide for today's lecture? So let's go back and look at this. Oh, actually, you know what? That one's not a good one to show you. I don't think I have a good one to show you. Um, so we've been playing games. We've been uh, performing some trickery with the code that you've been running in our playground up until this point. It's been allowing you to do that. But I just wanna make sure this is clear, because it can be confusing once we start to use these new examples. In Java, it is not valid Java to just declare a function. I can't declare a function outside of a class. It's not valid Java to just have some code that's going to run. I can't de declare what's called loose code outside of a function, and I can't declare a function outside of a class. Why have we been hiding this from you up to this point? Because it's confusing. Because I don't want you coming in here on day one and looking at a class declaration and a method declaration, and then it's like system.out.println hello world. Like, that's frightening. So we've been playing games with this to allow you to work in a little bit of a simplified environment. But Java has very strict rules about this. I can't have a function outside of a class. If you try to compile that in IntelliJ or Android Studio, it won't work, right? We're only getting away with it because um, we've been playing some games. So from this point forward, our examples are going to look a little bit different. So up until this point, we've been letting you write loose code outside of a class declaration. So up until this point, something like this would work. Okay, so I was able to put a, a println statement up here. Uh-oh. Come on, friend, let's do this. Well, anyway, whenever this gets finished running, this is no longer going to work, okay? All the code you write has to be inside a class declaration. Frightened that this isn't running. Let me try reloading it, see what happens. There it is, okay. Let me put it outside and just make sure it still breaks. Oh, something was wrong with my slide runner. Okay, we'll fix that later. All right, so that, that, that's clearly not going to work anymore. It should produce an error message, but we'll go back and fix that later. But right, so going forward, and this is true from this day forward, all the playground examples we do in class are gonna have this format. We're gonna start showing you how to build class declarations. Now there's a little, still a little bit of magic here that you won't understand for like one more class. But here's what's gonna happen. Whenever you run code in our playground now, execution is gonna start in the main method of the example class. From that point, you can do whatever else you want. You can call other methods, you can write code in there, you can do whatever you want, but that's where things are gonna start. We're not gonna run loose code that's written outside of this, okay? Now, the nice thing about this is we can still put multiple classes inside, um, we can still put multiple classes inside the same playground, right? So if I wanted to declare a dimensions class, that's still going to work. 
And we're gonna use that to our advantage as we start to do some examples. Okay, so here's, here's an example in this new format. This is similar to what we did last time, but I just wanna show you how it looks a little bit different. So up at the top, I'm declaring my dimensions class with the width and the height, and an area method that returns the area of that particular dimensions object. Down here, I'm creating a new dimensions object, so this is good review. On line 11, I'm creating, I'm declaring a new variable of type dimensions. Remember, I can create my own types now, so this is my type. I'm calling it example. And on the right side, I have this syntax that we've been using, where I use a new keyword, the name of the class, and then something that looks a lot like a function call, right? I've got two, I've got two curly, you know, two, uh, parentheses here, there's nothing inside of it, that sort of looks like a method call, and it is a method call, and we're gonna explain exactly what's happening here in a minute. But here I'm setting the width and height of that dimensions object, and then I'm calling the area method and expecting to get the result that I want. Let's make sure this works. Good. Okay. So let's talk about that special method, okay? So this thing right here, when I call new, the syntax of creating an object in Java is the new keyword that says I want to create a new object, use the name of the class, and then I have two parentheses. That is, in fact, a method call. It looks like one, and it is one. The special method that's being called is something called a constructor, and it does what the name implies. It constructs a new instance of that type of object, that type of class, a new instance of that class. Now, the constructor is responsible and can do any initial setup that needs to be done to create the object and initialize it properly. So here's an example. Now, constructors as methods that are part of a class have a special syntax, okay? So who, so that's a, this is a, this is a valid constructor. Who can tell me something weird about it? Yeah. It has no return type, aha, that's correct. Constructors do not declare a return type. The reason is they always return a new instance of that object. That's the only thing they can do. So you don't even, and, and I don't have to call return anywhere inside my constructor. That happens automatically. So there's no return type, and then there's something else about this constructor. Yeah. Yeah, it shares the same name as the class, exactly. So my class is called course, and the instructor has to share, the constructor has to share the exact same name. And that means, this is the one case in Java where you can start a method with an uppercase letter, and typically will, because your classes are gonna start with uppercase letters, that's our naming convention, that's how we know that it's an object, instead of a primitive type, and so your constructor needs to be named after the class, and the con so the constructor's also going to start with a capital letter. Constructors, again, are responsible for doing any initial setup that has to be done in order to create a new instance of that class, a new object of, that has the type of that class. In this case, what am I doing? Well, I'm saying, if you wanna create an instance of type course, that course has to have a name. Because when you call the constructor, you're gonna have to now pass a parameter, all right? You can, constructors are like other methods. You can overload them, you can create as many as you want with different type signatures. The other special thing about constructors that's not obvious from their declaration is they can only be run once. I can never call the constructor again. They're only run when the object is created. So I can never call them again. It's not like another method on the class that I could call it multiple times. The constructor gets called once when the object is created and cannot be called again later. Now the constructor itself can call other methods that are part of the class, which you could then call again later, but I can't call the constructor again. So 
just to reiterate what we just pointed out, the constructor has to be named after the class. It has to be declared to not return any anything. And it always returns a new instance of that type of object. You should create constructors as part of your classes to do any type of initialization that is required to create a valid instance of that class. So a constructor is something that you create when you design your classes. And this is an opportunity for you to make choices about things like what are the default settings for different fields? Are certain fields required for someone to create an instance of this object and things like that, right? Okay. So, now, I can, and like other functions, like I said a minute ago, I can overload constructors. So you'll typically find classes that have multiple different constructors with different method signatures. So here I've got two different constructors. So now what I'm saying is, hey, if you wanna create a course object, an instance of type course, you can either create it and pass a name that I'll use to set the name of the course, or if you want, you don't know the name yet, you can call an empty constructor and I'll set the name to an empty string. So I've got two different constructors here that are called depending on how many arguments I pass. Hey guys. Constructors can, so, in a lot of cases, I wanna use one constructor to call another constructor. I can do this using, by using this. So this is not only a special variable that refers to an instance of that class, but I can also use it like a method. So here, I've simplified the example I used a minute ago. So now I have one constructor that sets the name. And then if I have an empty constructor, that's sometimes what we call a constructor that takes no arguments, that calls the constructor that takes an argument with an argument that's just an empty string. So if I start, if I call this constructor, I get to set the name. If I call this constructor with no arguments, the name ends up as the empty string. We're gonna do an example of this in a minute. Now, so you might wonder, we've been using objects up till this point. We've had this dimension object that we were playing around with and stuff like that. Why didn't I have to provide a constructor? So if you don't provide a constructor, Java will simply not initialize any of the fields on your object. So if you don't provide a constructor, there's a default empty constructor. And you can think of it as just this, okay? So this is the default constructor that is added by Java if you don't provide any other constructors. Now one thing to point out is as soon as you provide an empty constru uh, any constructor, you lose this empty constructor. So the empty constructor is only provided if there's no other constructors. Typically, you do not want to use the empty constructor. It doesn't do anything useful, okay? So typically when you define a class, and this is one of the things about Java that I would argue is kind of broken, you should really be required to provide a constructor for your class. The empty constructor is not helpful. All right. Let me, let me, let me get to an example here. I'll come back and do this in a sec. Okay, so we'll come back and talk about this in a minute. Okay. So now let's say I've got my person class here, and let's say I'm gonna have you know, I'm gonna use my usual fields here. I'm gonna have it, each person's gonna have a name. And then let's, um, let's use a double as an age, to be a little, little more precise. So at this point, I haven't provided a constructor. So what do we think the value, now this code will work. I'm not gonna display anything yet. What do you think the value of age is going to be? Anyone have a guess? Yeah. Zero. Yeah, so the, the uninitialized value of a double and all of the other numeric types is zero. 
So remember, the constructor didn't, the empty constructor doesn't set any fields. And so if I don't set, and you can look this up online, Java has a documentation page about this, if I don't set the value of a double, it defaults to zero. So that's okay, I guess. I don't know, I, I might be, that seems like a re reasonable default value. What about the name, though? Now here's a problem. What do you think this is gonna be? Yeah. Yeah. Let's find out. Indeed. So the name is gonna be null. So any objects that are part of my class, like if I create a new, let's just create a new example up here, public class dimensions, dimensions, we'll just have this be empty. If I change this, of course I wouldn't do this because, well, people have dimensions, I guess. Um, that's also null. Yeah, any object that's uninitialized, that variable is set to null. And that's a problem because, you know, what if I wanna do something like, set this back to a string, say, figure out what the length of your name is, now I have this runtime error that I'm trying to avoid. So this is one of the reasons why it's so important to write constructors. If you don't write one, and you use an empty constructor, you end up with values for the fields that are not only not helpful, but they may cause errors. Okay, so let's provide a constructor for this class. All right, so we're gonna call it, we have to call it person. So by default, this is gonna behave the same way. So I can write an empty constructor for my class that does no initialization, that was already there, right? But the kind of cool thing here is that as soon as I provide a constructor that takes an argument, let's provide, let's require that you set the age of the person when you create. Oh, something, something is wrong here, I, I apologize. I think what's happening is errors aren't being shown properly, which is sad. But we, we will fix this after class. I wish I had noticed this this morning. All right, so if we could see it, what's gonna happen here is there's gonna be a compiler error. The compiler is gonna, is gonna tell me you can't call this empty constructor anymore because you've declared a constructor that has a field, okay? So now if I want this to work, I'm gonna have to actually, I'll first get my Wi-Fi working again. Step one. switch over to this other slide back. This is working fine, I think. All right. All right. I'm over here now. Okay, good. So now I'm gonna go back to my age here, and then I'll, I'll write a constructor that sets the age. Set age is equal to set age. And now, if I set this, 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 this should work. Now let's print what happens. Okay. Again, I apologize about the error with the playground. Clearly we need to test this a little bit more. Um, but if I give it a valid age, I'm good, right? Um, if I pass in something that's a, you know, this is just another method, right? If I pass in something that here is a string or whatever, I'm not gonna get the right result. So now let's imagine that I add another field. Let's put our name back. Every person should have a name. And if I want to require you to set the name, I can change my constructor so that it requires both fields. And now this will work. Name.length. So now I can print the length of your name. Okay, any questions about this before we back up for a minute and then go on? Let's write a second constructor, just for fun. Let me just do this quickly and then I, I will take that question. Say, let's say we wanna have a case where I only set the name of the person, I use the default value for the age, 
I'm gonna call my primary constructor with the default argument, and now I have two constructors. I allow you to create an instance of the class with just the name, or you can create an instance of the class with the name and an age. Question over here. Ah, right, okay, so the question is, why does my main method have a, a parameter called unused? So this, th this was designed to match the way that the main method works when you run it in an actual Java program, right? Um, we, ta we talked about this when we talked about main a couple of classes ago. Yeah, yeah. No, so one, okay, so what happens here? What am I doing here? So let's, let's see what happens when this constructor gets called. Let's put a print lens statement here. Okay. Man, this is so angry with me today. <laughs> Wi-Fi in here is also going down, which is not good. All right, I give up <laughs> with this example. Let me go back here, maybe by the time I'm done talking about this, the playground will have recovered. All right. So one of the things about constructors that's interesting, and potentially problematic for you right now, is that they have to return an instance of that class. There's no way for them to fail. You can't use a return statement inside a constructor. It's just gonna run, and when it gets to the bottom, it's gonna return a new instance of that object. So any setup you do will get done, any setup you don't do won't get done. There's no way to return, um, and in particular, I can't fail. So the constructor is always gonna return a new instance of that class. Let's say I pass bad arguments. So what's an example of a bad argument that I could pass to set name? 10, some people might have the name 10. That could be an okay name. I don't judge, yeah. Yeah, what if I pass null to my name variable? Then, essentially, I'm, the same thing is happening that I was trying to avoid. I'm, I, I feel pretty confident that a person should have a name. Maybe their name is null, the string null. That's okay. Again, I don't judge, but they shouldn't have an empty name. So the problem here is that if I passed you null, normally in a function when you guys write them for your homework problems and on the quizzes, we tell you how to handle null. This is a bad value and you're supposed to do something to respond to that. The constructor doesn't really, you guys don't yet have a good way to do this. The constructor has to return a new instance of the object. So if you don't set name, name's going to be null. If you set it to null, it's going to be null. Um, so those are your two options, and they both achieve the same thing. We will talk more about this when we come back and talk about static methods in a couple of classes, and then later in the semester when we discuss exceptions, because those are a couple of the strategies that you have for avoiding this problem. Okay, nope, oh, still going. Any questions about constructors before we go on and talk about visibility a little bit? So, you know, again, I don't want to, you know, do you guys to feel like this is mysterious. Constructors are a method that you write, that runs code. It just happens to be a special method that gives a chance to do specific initialization that you want to do every time a new instance of the object is created. Yeah. What's that? No, yeah, so a constructor can only be called once. There's no way to even name the method later. So the method, the constructor gets called when the new keyword is used to create the instance of the object, and there's no way to call it after that point. Yeah. So, you know, go back to my sad, stalled playground here. I could, so I could do something like this, for example. 
I could have a, I could have a setup person method that takes a string set name and a double set age. And then I could do this. So that would work. So now, do you see the difference? Now I have a method that I've declared as part of my class that I can use later, right? So now if I had a person object and my playground didn't hate me, I could do you dot set up person and I could pass whatever I wanted. Yeah. So I can't call the constructor, but there's nothing stopping you from creating a constructor that uses a field on that object. No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, the way the Java compiler works, it, the method order within the class is developed. Yeah. This is a, I think Python has that problem, but Java doesn't. But yeah. Ah, good question. Okay, so. Do I need to set the constructor private or public? I can use those keywords. We're gonna talk about visibility in just a sec. The constructor, oh man, okay. I, I, I'm gonna, so you can use private on a constructor definitely. I feel like the constructor, by default will be public, but I'm not sure about that. I'm gonna have to look that up. But I can use those visibilities on constructors. You might wonder, why would I ever declare a constructor private? And it turns out that there are valid arguments for doing that. We'll come back and talk about that when we talk about static. Okay, other questions about constructors? Like I said, you know, this is the point in the semester where, you know, this is not tricky objects and thinking about how we model data using them is more conceptually challenging than the stuff that we've done before, even if the code is super simple, right? I mean, all we're doing is setting fields on our object. All right. So, so let's talk a little bit about visibility or what Java refers to as access modifiers. You guys have started to see these around, and so again, now that you've, you know, noticed them and might have wondered about them a little bit, let's talk a little bit about what they actually are. So when you're designing your class, one of the things that you might want to do is you might want to control how that class is used. You might want to control who can run certain methods. You might want to control who can set certain fields. So Java provides what are called access modifiers that you can use on both instance variables and instance methods. So both on the data and on the algorithms that are part of your method. So these are referred to as access modifiers. There are actually two, the two of them that we're gonna look at right now are public and private. There are actually two more. There's something called protected and there's something called package private, which is essentially you, you get by not including an access modifier, which is confusing. But, um, but for now, let's focus on public and private. So public and private do sort of what you would think based on their name. So when I mark a method or a instance variable as public, that allows anybody who has an instance of that class to use it. If it's a variable, they can modify it or retrieve it. If it's a method they can call it. So here I've got a public class person, and what I've decided is that when I design this class, for whatever reason, I want anybody to be able to modify the name. So I've marked it explicitly as public. But I only want my methods, methods that are defined on this class, to be able to change the age. So private doesn't mean that the variable can never be modified, that wouldn't make any sense. Instead, private means that only methods that are part of that class are allowed to either retrieve or modify the value of that particular variable. So my age variable now can only be set or retrieved by methods that I define on this class, okay? So now if I ran the following code and I created a new person on line seven, I can modify the name. That's okay because I marked the name as public. But if I go to try to retrieve the age, that's gonna cause a compiler error. 
So the compiler is gonna say, the age here is marked as private, and this code is not running inside the class, okay? So a public variable can be read or written by anyone. A private variable can only be read or written by methods defined on that class, right? Oh, Lord. Let's see if this is gonna spring back to life or not. Nope. Bear with me for a second. I'm, I'm nervous that the, the Wi-Fi in here has gone down, so let me see if I can reconnect to this, my access point. Is the website down for anybody else? Okay. Sweet. That makes me happy. for now, we're back online. Um, that may happen again in like 30 seconds, but let's see how far we can get, okay. So let's declare, let's, let's, let's do this example. So let's declare our, our name, and let's declare our age to be, you know, again, to be, let's declare the name to be public, the age to be private, and now let's set new not name is equal to test. Make sure that this code still compiles, which it does. And let's print u.name. Good, okay. Let's try setting u.age. Hope that this probably isn't gonna crash. Eh, yeah. I think, it's, I think it's me crashing my own, my own system. So, put this back here, public string name. Private int age. And now, if, if you set the age, we're gonna see that it's gonna hang. If I change this to public, however, then I can set and retrieve the age. I could until a second ago. All right, it's really not my day, so I'm just gonna Go on. Any questions about constructors or about, oh wait, okay, we're doing access modifier, sorry. Ugh. All right, so we're just gonna have to stick with looking at these examples today, right? Once I modify, this is like back to the dark ages, like two years ago when there was no playground. Um, so once I modify, once I add the private access modder to a variable, then I can't change that variable any longer, right, from outside that, that piece of code. Okay, so public, anybody can read or write that variable. Private, the variable can only be read or written by methods defined on that class, okay? And you're gonna have to trust me that this works. I can apply the same access modifiers to functions or to methods that I define on the class. And the meaning is similar. Although with a function, like, there's no set or get. It's just, can I run the function or not? If I mark the method as public, then anybody can execute it. So here, line 10, it's gonna work fine, because print it has been marked as public. Line 12, on the other hand, is going to fail, because print u has been marked as private. So public, anybody can run it. Private can only be run by other methods on that class. 
So for example, print it can call print you. But I can't call it from outside the class itself. All right? And again, you have to believe me. There are a couple of other access modifiers that exist in the Java world. Um, there are, there is one called protected that you may see lying around. Um, and there's something called package private. But neither one of those makes sense until we have a little bit more of a notion of what a package is, right? So we may come back to those later in the semester, right? Okay, so let me show you a common pattern. So up until this point, when we've declared a class, if we wanted to use the variables to find down that class, we declared them as public. And then anybody could set or get those variables. However, that's not how it's typically done in Java. And in fact, if you try to do this, the default check style rules that are a little different for our playground, but the default check style rules will complain. They will say you can't, you shouldn't create public instance variables, which is weird, right? Because then it's like, how do I store information as part of my class? So this is the pattern that the Java community arrived at. And this is interesting because this was not something that was part of the original Java language specification. But this became such a common pattern that if you look at the JVM languages that emerged like Kotlin and Scala and Groovy, they all follow this pattern. Okay, so here's, here's the design pattern. Again, there's no rules about this. This is a convention, but it's a very strong convention. If I want to store data on my class, I do the following. I create a private variable to store the data. So online, so this person is gonna have an age. But I just don't let anyone set it by marking it public. Instead, I mark it private. Then, I create two functions. And these functions have very specific signatures. We're gonna have, we're gonna have you guys write some of these for later quizzes and homework problems. And at some point, all we're gonna tell you is, write a getter for this variable. And we expect you to do something that looks exactly like this. Okay? So on line three, I have something called a setter. The name is set, followed by the name of the variable. It returns nothing. It takes one argument, the same type as the variable that it's used to change. And all it does is modify that variable. So this is a function that I use to set the value of age. Okay, great. This is known as a setter. On line six, so how do I retrieve the value? It's private. So now I can change it, but I can't get it. So I write a separate function on line six that's called a getter. The name is get, followed by the name of the variable. All it does is return the variable that I'm requesting, and the type that it returns is the same type as whatever variable that is. Okay, so again, this is not, this is something that is built in to languages that inherited from Java, but it's not built into Java. So this is the pattern that we follow, okay? Private variable, two functions. These functions are boilerplate. In fact, you can get IntelliJ to generate these functions for you. Android Studio will do this. There's a way to say, you know, generate the constructor for this variable, and this is what it will produce the getters and setters, sorry, getters and setters for this variable, right? So you might wonder, like, why? This seems weird. I, why not just mark it public, okay? So I, before I had one piece of code here that marked it public and I was good. Now I have six lines of extra code that I've introduced into the problem. We're gonna clear out here a little bit early today, because the class coming in here has an exam, so I'm gonna leave you with this cliffhanger of a question that's answered on the next slide, and we will pick up here on Friday. All right, um, if you haven't taken the midterm yet, good luck. Um, I have office hours today from one to three. I will get the playground back up right after class, um, and I hope you guys have a great Thursday. I will see you on Friday. <laughs>